Now tonight, uh, the su- the title I will give for the message is God in Our Suffering. No, I will do my best not to make this, uh, in fact, I don't find it a discouraging message at all. Um, but, uh, you know, suffering is not exactly something pleasant, but it's something we go through. And so I, I just uh, felt to share this with you. And God in our suffering. There are some who question if God is a good God, how can he allow suffering? That's a common a common uh, objection we'll hear. You may hear a question from atheists or non-believers. How could a good God allow such evil? How could a good God allow all this suffering and allow all this to happen? Now, setting aside the questions of Ruud was defining good and evil. We're not we're not going in there tonight. Um, that that uh, unbelievers would have. Um, there is a question that can be difficult to answer, even for believers. And when I say it's difficult to answer. It's not that we don't know the answer. It's that even once the answer intellectually is understood and, and, and said with the mind, doesn't mean always that in the moment it is, it is there. It, is, it, it sometimes may not feel as real as, as we would like. We know that God is good. We know that God is working all things together for good. We know that in eternity everything will, will be enough. It will all work out. That's fine. Those thoughts are comforting and they're necessary. But I'll submit to you that they're not always enough. And and I'll show you, and I'll explain what I mean by that. Not to say that they're wrong, but sometimes, you know, when we're with people who have experienced a painful loss, a tragedy, um, someone has passed, someone is sick, someone has a disease, someone has left, a family is destroyed, a family is broken, all of these things, it's fine to know that it all works together for good. But the Lord gives us much more than that. The Lord offers in Christianity something a lot more than just knowing intellectually that all things work out for good. He brings so much more. And that's what I'm here to share with you tonight. God in our suffering. There is an even greater comfort that comes, and that comes directly from Christ. Not just the intellectual knowing that all things work together, but that when we're in our suffering, we know Christ. And Christ is with us. There's an apologist named John Lennox who often speaks about suffering. Uh, he's had some very famous debates with some of the top atheistic intellectuals. Um, and uh, he speaks about the problem of evil. And one thing that he says, and it's true, that separates Christianity from all the other religions of the world is that God is not distant in our suffering. He is not alienated from our suffering. It's not something that he just sees happen to us. But when Christ became a man, when God became a man in Christ... He experienced suffering. God is not distant. He did not just make a world where suffering exists, but he himself became a human. He took on human form and he experienced very real suffering, much in the same way that you or I do. The world that Jesus grew up in was not an easy place. It was not an easy time. He didn't choose to enter a a realm of history where things were all going to go well. Rome ruled with an iron fist, and Jesus was going to suffer an absolutely brutal death. He was going to be nailed to a cross and to suffer and to suffer tremendously. But it wasn't only on the cross that Jesus suffered. That was physical suffering. But remember, he knew what it was like to lose a loved one. The the Bible doesn't tell us exactly when, but it's clear from the way the narrative plays out that at some point his father Joseph passed away. Jesus knew what it was like to experience suffering. He knew what it was like to be rejected by his closest friends. He was betrayed by one of his 12 disciples. Basically, these are the 12 people that he chosen to be with him throughout his ministry. They were his closest friends. And one of them, whom he knew was going to do this, betrayed him. Sold him out for money. What about the rest? None of the disciples, if you think about this, if you think about what happened here, here is a man whom the disciples have followed and they believe he's the Messiah. Or, you know, there was, you know, they at least believed, you know, he was the one, right? And here they were walking with him. He was arrested and they knew he was going through a sham trial. They knew exactly what the leaders wanted to do. And none of them stood up for his defense. I mean, normally you would, right? You would want... You would want to have, you know, if someone's coming up and it's a character assassination, you would hope that your friends would say, no, I know that this man is not doing these things. I know that these are false accusations. But no one came to Jesus' defense. 
Worse than that, one of them, Peter, even openly denied ever knowing him. That's suffering. Emotional suffering, physical suffering. Jesus knew what it was to suffer. He suffered in every way. He knew loss and rejection. He stepped, this is the world he stepped into. God is not alienated us when we suffer. God is present with us and he experienced that pain, that suffering, much as we do. He didn't step into a perfect world with perfect peace. He stepped into a world of tremendous suffering. He left peace behind. He left perfection behind. That's what heaven is. And that's what he chose to leave as he came, came down and became a man. And most importantly, he left it to suffer with us, but not just with us, but to suffer for us. To suffer in our place. To suffer as one who took the punishment that we rightly deserved. So when we say, you know, it's fine to know that everything's going to work out, and it is good. You know, it's, it's a tremendous comfort to know that all things work together for good to those who love God and those that are called according to his purpose. But even more than that, we have a Savior who is with us and who suffered and knows what it means to suffer and is with us every step of the way. He is God in our suffering. He, he isn't one who's distant, but he embraced that suffering. He embraced the cross. He took on human form to be made like one in us to suffer and die. That is what we see in the incarnation, and that is what we have as the basis of our Christianity. And so, you know, if you're suffering, if you're feeling down, remember that Jesus sees. And he doesn't just see, but he identifies because he went through it. He went through it. He was tempted in all points like as we are, yet without sin. And he went through so many things to be like us in the sense to experience what we have experienced, to have that true empathy. He's with us in the mountains and the valleys, and he is the God in our suffering. Let's turn to the shortest verse in the Bible. I know we know where that one is. John eleven thirty five. 35. Um, if you were like me, it was one, you know, if you had to memorize a verse and they didn't say which one, you know, get to pick John eleven thirty five. you can remember that one pretty quick. God understands and identifies with our suffering. John 11, verse 35, it says, Jesus wept. You know, it's one of the short, it is the shortest verse in the Bible, but it's also extremely profound. And I want to look a little bit at the, the lead up to this. Many of us know the story, but let's look up a little bit at the lead up to this when we find that Jesus wept. In verses 3 through 6 of the same chapter, John 11, verses 3 through 6 says, Therefore his center, sisters, speaking of Lazarus, his sisters sent unto him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom thou lovest is sick. When Jesus heard that, he said, This sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God might be glorified thereby. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. When he had heard, therefore, that he was sick, he abode two days still in the same place where he was. So here, Lazarus is sick. And it says very clearly, they said, Jesus, the one whom you love, Lazarus, he's sick. And the text confirms it later on, saying, yes, Jesus loved Mary, Jesus loved Martha, Jesus loved Lazarus. There was a special bond there that Jesus has with them. So when Jesus gets the news... You would think, okay, that means Jesus is going to go. But no, he specifically stays there for two more days in the same place. He gets the news. He understands it completely, says it's not unto death, but for the glory of God. They didn't understand what that meant because when it comes down to it, you're going to find it turns out way different than what they expected. I'm very sure of that. But here's the point. Jesus knew what he was doing. And when the message came, he waited. He waited. Now let's carry on in verse 7 through 14. Then after that, saith he to his disciples, let us go into Judea again. So after he's waited two days, he says, okay, now it's time to go. His disciples say unto him, Master, the Jews of late sought to stone you, and are, goest thou thither again? Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours in the day? If any man walk in the day, he stumbleth not, because he seeth the light of this world. But if a man walk in the night, he stumbleth, because there is no light in him. These things said he... And after that, he saith unto them, Our friend Lazarus sleepeth, but I go, that I may wake him out of sleep. Then his disciples, then said his disciples, Lord, if he sleep, he shall do well. Howbeit Jesus spake of his death, but they thought that he had spoken of taking re of rest and sleep. Then Jesus said unto them plainly, Lazarus is 
dead. So I want to get here and notice here that Jesus is fully aware of exactly what's happening. He doesn't, he's not surprised by any of this that happens. Um, and that's important as we look at the later parts. Because what does Jesus do? He waits intentionally two days, and then he doesn't need another message to come and tell him. He tells the disciples, okay, now it's time to go. And he says, Lazarus is dead. He already knows. He didn't need another message. He already knew ahead of time that Lazarus had passed on. And so Jesus was in full knowledge. He was in full control here. And then he comes to go to, to Bethany. He comes to see Mary and Martha. And so Jesus was very clear that he knew at this point, because he'd already said it wasn't unto death, but for the glory of God. So Jesus, from the beginning, knew what was going to happen, and he ordained it this way. He, he had ordained that, yes, Lazarus was going to pass, but that he was going to raise him from the dead. That's very clear when you look at the whole thing in context, you see that. And yet, this is what makes verse 35 so remarkable, because though, even though Jesus knew that he was going to raise Lazarus from the dead, even though he knew that the end was going to be glorious, that Martha and Mary are going to be reunited, with Lazarus and be so happy, yet he wept. He still wept when the people were crying, when they were mourning for Lazarus, and in their pain and in their suffering, Jesus fully identified with it, and he wept. It didn't matter that ultimately it was going to be right. Yes, that was true. But still, in their moment of their grief and in the moment of their sorrow, Jesus was with them, and he wept. He fully identified with that human suffering. Yes, it's wonderful that we can say God's going to work it all out. And yet it's also wonderful to say that when we are suffering and when we are in pain, Jesus is there with us. And he feels our pain. And he identifies with human suffering. Looking back at a couple verses here. We see when both in verse 21, we don't, we're not going to read them specifically, but verse 21 and verse 32, Martha and Mary, they come to Jesus separately and both of them have the same thing to say to him. Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Undoubtedly, they talked, I mean, they're sisters. I'm sure they talked about this. You know, they had sent for Jesus. They knew Jesus loved him. They were sure he was going to come. Jesus didn't come. And they said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. He could have stopped this terrible tragedy. He could have prevented their pain. Why did he not come? Why did they have to go through this? Why did they have to suffer this terrible loss? They had faith. They knew Jesus could have stopped the tragedy. They knew he could have stopped it. Now, we know this story has a happy ending because Lazarus was raised from the dead. It's not how it always is. It's not how it always is. There are many times there's an irreparable loss and it isn't made right, at least not in this life. The suffering come, the pain stays, it doesn't leave. Maybe we believe just like Martha and Mary. We're sure that if Jesus came, he could fix it. If Jesus came, everything would be fine. But there are times when the Lord doesn't come. Even if we have a faith. It's not a matter of having the faith there, but it's sometimes just to know that you know the Lord has his perfect plan and he has his perfect will. You know, that Jesus delayed and caused them to go through this pain. He didn't have to do that. He could have stopped it. He could have said, you don't have to go through that. I'm not going to make you pass through that circumstance. I'm just going to come. I'm going to heal Lazarus right away. And you don't ever have to experience that loss, even if it's only temporary. But he didn't. It wasn't his will. So whether the story has a happy ending... In this life, we know it has a happy ending in the end. And that's, that's an important point. We know that God works all things together for good. We know that everything works out to those who love God. But if it doesn't, if it doesn't have a happy ending right now that we can see and experience in this life, yet we know one thing. Jesus promised us in Hebrews 13 verse 5, I will never leave you nor forsake you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. That is the promise that we have in Jesus. See, even when we do experience suffering, and sometimes we see a miraculous healing, sometimes the Lord, there's a situation where we're estranged from a loved one and it's just tearing us apart, and yet, there, and then the Lord brings a reconciliation. But sometimes that doesn't happen. Sometimes there's suffering, and we don't know why. 
And there's so many, you know, we all know of people that have gone through terrible loss. We know people who have been sick for long times. You know, I, I don't have to go through this. We know people who have had such terrible tragedies. But the number one thing, yes, we know God will work it all out. He always does. He is perfectly just. But also to know that he is with us in our suffering. He didn't just create a world with suffering and say, well, that's the world. I'm going to be here. I'm going to be fine from it. I'm not going to experience that. But Jesus came and became one of us and suffered with us. And he walks with us as we suffer. He weeps with those who weep, as we are even commanded to do. When people are having a hard time, the Lord is right there. Mary and Martha had no idea why Jesus didn't fix Lazarus. They don't know why he didn't intervene to stop the pain. And many times we won't know why God allows that suffering to happen. We won't know why God just didn't fix it. Why didn't he just intervene, step down, and just take it all away? Yet what we can know is that he will never leave us. Never. He is always with us in our suffering. And it is that way throughout history. I don't know. I'm sh- how many of you have read the b- work, the Fox's Book of Martyrs? I'm sure most of you probably have. I mean, that's not what you want to call an uplifting work, right? I mean, it's, it is a story of how Christians were tortured throughout history for the name of Christ. Sometimes suffering has a purpose in the sense that you are suffering for a specific cause. You are suffering as a martyr for Jesus. And sometimes it is just because of the fallen state of humanity in which we live in and that this is a fallen and broken world which the Lord will sometime redeem. We don't always know what it happens, but what we know is that Jesus was with every single one of those martyrs. And he is with us in all of our suffering and in all of our pain. And he will never leave us and never forsake us. We know there's a very famous poem. Everyone, I think, knows it. So many people have it up on their walls. uh, Footprints, right? I mean, it's such a famous poem. It's not entirely scriptural in the sense that it's not based on a scripture, but I believe it's absolutely true. And I'm just going to read it here. One night I dreamed a dream as I was walking along the beach with my Lord. Across the dark sky flashed scenes of my life. From each scene I noticed two sets of footprints in the sand, one belonging to me, and one to my Lord. After the last scene of my life flashed before me, I looked back at the footprints in the sand. I noticed that at many times along the path of my life, especially at the very lowest and saddest times, there was only one set of footprints. This really troubled me, so I asked the Lord about it. Lord, you said once I decided to follow you, you'd walk with me all the way. But I noticed that during the saddest and most troublesome times of my life, there was only one set of footprints. I don't understand why. When I needed you the most, you would leave me. He whispered, My precious child, I love you and will never leave you. Never, ever, during your trials and testings. When you saw only one set of footprints, it was then that I carried you. And I believe that is our Lord. It may not feel like it sometimes. It may not seem like it. But when we are going through the most difficult times, the Lord is closer than ever. Let's read the verse Isaiah chapter 63 and verse 9. Isaiah chapter 63 and verse 9. Isaiah 63 verse 9 says, In all their affliction he was afflicted. And the angel of his presence saved them. And in his love and in his pity, he redeemed them and bare them and carried them all the days of old. He was afflicted in all the affliction of his people. And that was not just an Old Testament thing. Do not the scars that the Lord Jesus bears on his body show how he was afflicted for us and how he suffers for us and then indeed He knows and identifies and is with us in all our affliction, in all our sorrow. Scripture tells us that we are the apple of his eye. We're the most sensitive part of him. When people hurt us, God is right there and he feels our pain. And as a father, it's not hard to understand that. If your child suffers, you suffer. If someone you love is going through heartbreak, you are suffering. 
And that's only with our human love. With the tremendous God-awesome love that He has for each one of us when we suffer, He feels it. And it's in those most difficult times, even as it says here, that He buried them old and carried them all the days of old. He carries us. It is in those most difficult times that He carries us. He is not distant in our suffering, but He is ever-present. He is our comfort and our ultimate hope, not just for eternity, but even as we pass through the difficult times of life now. One more verse here in 1 Thessalonians. I'm just saying one more verse here, not not necessarily the final one. I want to make that clear. I don't want to be one of those false starts, you know, or false stops, whatever you want to call it. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 13. 1 Thessalonians 4 verse 13 says, But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, for ye so- that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. We have hope. We have that ultimate hope that Jesus will come again, that we will be raised and there will be that new resurrection. You know, whatever, how, whether we're alive when that happens or if we've already died, you know, whatever, it doesn't matter. In Christ, we have that hope. Our suffering has a purpose. Our suffering has a purpose. Everything has a purpose. And in our suffering, we may not always see that. We may know it in our minds. But sometimes it's hard to see what that purpose is. And those are the times that even more we cling to the Lord and we say, Yes, Lord, I know I have hope in you. And I know, Lord, that you are here. You are with me. You are present. Just because we don't always see it and we don't feel it necessarily when we're in the difficult times. The Lord is not there looking to condemn us when we're in the clouds. When we're struggling with difficulty, he's not looking, wondering why you're not doing better. Instead, he's with you, he's carrying you, and he's giving you the comfort that you need. He's our ever-present help in time of trouble. And it's closer to us in these moments than we could ever know. We walk through fires. Sometimes the smoke is all around us. We can't see anything. You know, the tears are covering our faces so much that it's just blurry. And our whole life is, we don't know where things are going. And yet, the Lord proved his love for us when he died to save us. He proved his love for us when he took on human form and identified with our suffering and took our place. He's never distant. He is always with us in our suffering. And in fact, as as I said earlier, human suffering became a part of his everlasting story as he forever bears the scars that we place there through our sin. Truly, he will never leave you. He will never forsake you. And he is always present and always our loving Heavenly Father. One part of the song says, I'm living out the victory doesn't mean I won't feel the heat. And if you're struggling with through sorrow, it's okay to admit that you feel the heat. God wants you to pour out your heart to him. He wants you to say, Lord, I'm struggling. Lord, I don't understand. And to allow him to bring that peace. Living in victory doesn't mean that everything's perfect. But it means, you know, it doesn't mean that we're alienated from the consequences of a fallen world. We live in a fallen world. We live in a world that is full of sin and isn't right. Ever since we made the choice as a species, as a, as a, you know, a a group to turn away from God. But living in victory may simply mean that our faith is steadfast. That we believe that Christ is. We believe that his ways are good, that he's got the right path, and that he's with us. And though we can't see what he's doing, we don't see the future, the smoke's around, the tears are filling our eyes, we don't know the next step, but we still know Christ is with us. He suffered for us, he suffers with us, and he will never leave us and never forsake us. Somehow he's going to redeem it, we don't know. Sometimes we'll see that in this life. Sometimes we'll see, yes, Lord, I know, I can see what a beautiful plan you had, and it all works out. And sometimes we won't see that tapestry until we get to eternity. The difficulty will come. The fire will get hot. And we won't sometimes be able to see any way through it. But remember, we do not serve just an impersonal force that has laws and it's like rigid and it's just, you know, these are the laws, this is what happens, and it's, That is not God. God is a person. God is a being. He is not just an impersonal force that has absolute laws that are just X equals Y, Z equals 12. 
No, God is a being who is with us, who weeps in our pain. And even if we know that all things work together for good so that we'll be right in the end, there's nothing wrong with weeping. Because that's what Jesus did. And that's what Paul tells us to do, to weep with those who weep. Now, the Lord obviously wants us to move on to an extent, right? He wants us to, he doesn't want us to be always in that state. But when the Lord takes us through those times, let's remember that he is with us. He is ever-present. And he's redeeming the moments of pain that we are in. He's not separate from our grief, but he is bearing us on eagle's wings, carrying us through when we can't stumble along any further. He is present. He is God in our suffering. He weeps with us, and he will bring us through. Amen.